Good evening. I hope y'all are doing well today. I decided to do a few little excerpts. I, I think that's what I'll do. Right, right now, that's my plan. And you that have been listening to me for a while know that uh, my plans change from what I plan to do. But you know what? I did go through the whole book of Daniel teaching. I did that without uh, getting off course too much. So I'm kind of proud of proud of. I'm not going to say proud of myself because uh, it was not me that did it. It was God through me. So I, I give him thanks that I got through with that book. It took a year, but it's all on my YouTube channel if you want to go back because uh, this is just going to be a little excerpt from it. I'm not going to give you much scripture because you can look back on the, the Daniel playlist and find it in depth with, with all the scripture proving my points. So a lot of people just love a little a little brief telling of it, so that's kind of what I'm going to do today. And I, uh, I want to thank all of my subscribers. Y'all have been so wonderful. And uh, I, I thought I'd tell you just a tiny bit about myself. Not too much, but <laughs> I grew up in a, a little independent country church. Not many people, just a handful of people. But when I was a teenager, <laughs> and I hope I don't get teary-eyed, I feel I'm coming already. When I was a teenager, God blessed me with having one of the best pastors for about one and a half or two years as all he and his beautiful, sweet wife were there with us. He was one of the first graduates of Dr. Peter Ruckman's uh, school in Pensacola. His name's Brother Nathan Bemis. And wow, that man taught me so much. Sometimes he wouldn't preach. A lot of times he did not preach over 15 minutes a sermon, but oh my, my, everybody knew what he had preached when we walked, when we walked out of there. Well, years later, I, I always loved the Bible. The Bible, I, I loved it and I read it. I didn't study it in depth, but I read it. Uh, but then years later, I got to studying it more and thinking more. How can I learn more? And I, I thought, well, Brother Bemis was my favorite teacher, and he went to Dr. Ruckman's school, so why don't, I, why don't I get a few commentaries by Dr. Ruckman? So that's what I did, and so um, <laughs> they're hard reading through. Boy, if you've ever tried to read Dr. Ruckman's commentaries, mm, <laughs> you, um, you wade through it sometimes, but uh, the man is brilliant. There's not too much I found that I disagree with them about, but... Uh, I am the, the kind of person that when I'm reading through and I see something, now Dr. Ruckman will give you scripture references a lot of times. He won't write that verse out for you. He'll give you the reference. And I think, oh man, I got to look it up myself. But I think that's a good thing. And uh, although I knew Dr. Ruckman is brilliant and I had never disagreed with him about much of anything, maybe two things, that's all I can think of right now. I always had to look the scripture up. I had to see for myself before I tell y'all. And I want to tell you right now, I am just a teacher. I'm just a teacher that loves God's word. And I know God has called me to do it because I could not do it otherwise. I was not a good student. I can't remember anything. That's one reason I, I don't do a lot of these live things. I'd rather just... Uh, put a picture on, give it to you behind the scenes so you can't see me struggling to find my place when I lose it, what not. <laughs> but anyway, I, I've had a lot of mean comments though from um, just the other day a guy said, are women supposed to draw attention to themselves by wearing makeup? And I thought to myself, well, a lot of women draw attention to themselves by not wearing makeup, but I, it wasn't worth an answer. Uh, and then I've had people to tell me I'm going to hell for teaching. Now, mind you, I do not stand behind a pulpit or in a church and teach. I do this from my home, and anybody that wants to tune in can. So I, I am in God's will. I know I am, because all of us are supposed to be giving out God's Word. But I, I, I guess I don't know why I told y'all that. I guess... 
One reason I'm telling you that is because Satan wants to shut us up. Satan wants to hinder us any way he can. He'll do it through other Christian people if he can or other saved people. I won't call those kind of guys Christian because that means Christ-like and I know Jesus wants us giving out his beautiful words of life. But anyway, I don't know why I'm getting off on that. Let me get with this little little lesson. It's, like I said, it's just a little excerpt from Daniel 9, verse 27. And uh, the title of the YouTube lesson, the full-length lesson, was uh, The Seven-Year Covenant with Death and Hell. And um, especially in these last days, I believe we're living in the last days, especially in these days, Satan wants to shut us all up. So don't let him shut you up. Women, men, children, give God's word to people. People are dying and going to hell every day. And some saved people are living a horribly, horribly unhappy life just because they, they refuse or either don't know about following Jesus. We've got to give them the word. We've got to make a difference. Okay, Daniel nine twenty seven. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. The seven-year tribulation period is all about the Jews, but the covenant is with many. So someone else is involved besides just the Jews. The covenant involves somebody besides just the Jews. So in the lesson titled The Amazing Number Seven, I showed you how and why the Hebrew word translated here as weak means seven. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That word weak is a uh, translation of a Hebrew word that means seven. And it could be seven of anything, but since the context in Daniel 9 is talking about years, and also by comparing other scripture with this, we know that it's speaking about years. So the Jewish calendar, the civil calendar that they use for their religious holidays is used to figure this because the Bible is a history book about the Jewish people that begins with and ends with the Jew. We're just a little parenthesis in the middle of it. There's only about just a few chapters about the Gentiles. So the Jewish calendar is God's prophetic calendar for the end times. And aren't we so, so happy that God included us? Verse 27, the prince that shall come is the Antichrist. Scripture indicates that he is going to come into power as a very great political leader. Not at first, I guess. He'll probably kind of ease his way into that. In past YouTube studies using Scripture, I've described his peaceable rise to power. And... Um, Putting Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Revelation 17 together with other scriptures, we see that he is called a dreadful and terribly, exceedingly strong beast. This is not saying he is a beast, all right. But right here, this is saying that he is going to come on the scene as irresistible. He is going to be so strong. And he's going to come at a time that the world is going to be in chaos. He comes with all the answers to the world's problems. And you think we got problems now? They're just beginning. There's going to be more and more problems. He comes in peaceably, flattering everybody. And he will deceive the whole wide world. Everyone is going to think he's God's gift to man. Daniel 8.24 tells us he will be very powerful. Daniel eleven thirty six 36 says he will speak marvelous things that the world wants to hear. He will be so elegant in his speech. Everybody, everybody's going to fall for him. Everybody that's left and um, we Christians are going to be gone. We may 
we may see him right now, but when he reveals himself, we are going to be way out of here. So the only P, uh, and he's going to come, he's going to be an elegant speaker, speaking things the world wants to hear. Because one thing is he's going to be crying, peace, peace, peace. You know, he's just going to, mm, he's going to be the one to do it. But there is going to be no peace until the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, comes back again. And that's going to be at the end of the seven-year tribulation. And we Christians are going to come back with him because right before this all comes down, we're going up with Jesus. He's going to come in the clouds and take us out of here. Antichrist is going to be in agreement with the world system. He's going to go along with everything, everything. He's going to go along with uh, gay rights, abortion, open borders, transgender operations for children, just anything you want. He's going to pat you on the back and he is going to agree that, yeah, that's what we need to do. And the world's going to love him because he's going to be just like the world, the part of the world that is left. And, you know, there are going to be a lot of good moral people left that just didn't get saved, that just didn't accept Jesus. And you know what? They have no excuse, but we have no excuse either when we keep quiet and we don't give God's word to people because we're going to be partly to blame that they didn't get it. You got a good friend that you've never told about Jesus? Do you have a, um, a person that you work with every day that you never in conversation in any way mention Jesus? You could be doing that. So the world is going to love the Antichrist at first because he's going to be just like them. And uh, he's going to go along with all their agendas and the pesky, trouble-causing Christians are going to be out of here. So wow, wow, wow. And plus, they're going to have our stuff. <laughs> so after the first chaotic period, after the rapture, uh, things might be pretty good for a while. And they're going to really think, oh, he has brought peace to the world. So, okay, I'm, I'm going to repeat myself here again because that's what I do. But notice I did say the world will love him. We are not of the world. Jesus said, I'm not of the world and you're not of the world. If we're his child, we are not of the world. So I, I really do think Antichrist is alive today. He might just be a little boy. He might just be a teenager or he might be about to step into the limelight and play his last big role on this earth as a one world dictator. He will not be revealed for certain as to who he is. Um, well, the people left behind won't know for certain, and a lot of them still won't know for certain who he is till the middle of the tribulation period. But if anyone is left behind that studied their Bible at all, they should know when he signs that seven-year covenant in Daniel 9.27, that that is the beginning of the seven-year tribulation period. And if you think you see troubles now, you ain't seen nothing yet. So this agreement will be the beginning of the seven-year tribulation, also known as the time of Jacob's trouble. That's Israel's trouble. Israel, uh, Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and Jacob was the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. So that's the time of Jacob's trouble, the time of Israel's trouble. It's not the church's trouble. It's not the Christian's trouble. The wrath of God will be manifested at that time. Uh, people think they have trouble now, but they don't know anything about trouble yet. The purpose of the tribulation is to um, display the wrath of God on a sin-cursed, Christ-rejecting world and to get the Jews ready for their Messiah, to help them get to a place where they won't reject Jesus the second time He comes. The first time they did, but the second time He comes, they're going to have an eye-opening experience with Him 
that they won't be able to resist. And all the ones that are left behind alive that didn't take the mark, the remnant will be saved. So we Christians did not reject Jesus. We will not suffer the wrath of God. Scriptures prove we're not going to be here for those seven terrible years. Many scriptures prove that. We are a part of the body of Christ. We're in Christ. Christ's body has suffered all the wrath of, of God for sin when he took our sin on him on the cross, and he's not going to suffer any more of God's wrath. So since we are in Christ and we're part of his body, neither are we. This war that's going on in Israel right now, it, it may be what leads to this great political leader coming forward to lead the world to a short-lived peace. We don't know. Or this could go on for many, many years. We're not sure. But we do know <coughs> that before that covenant is signed, Jesus has taken us out of here. Are you ready? You ready to go? This is called the rapture. It's the catching away, catching away of, of saved people. Like I said, we will not be here to see the signing of the covenant. We could be here to hear the talks about that it's coming. We could be here to hear talks about, oh, there is this wonderful political leader that everybody is just loving. We could be here to to hear about talks of maybe a peace agreement. But we will not be here to witness the signing because, <coughs> excuse me, because that's, I believe, is going to begin the seven years. So um, <clears throat> we can't know. We can't know who the Antichrist is, but we can sure speculate because the Bible gives us uh, descriptions of him. It's not found in all of one chapter. It's found throughout the Bible, little pieces here, pieces there. You know, that's one way God has of getting us to read his book, getting us to study his book. If he put everything in one place, we'd read it one time and be done with it. But he wrote it in such a way that it speaks to us every time we pick it up. So with what um, I've studied, my thoughts are that we disappear from this earth. And when we do, there's going to be a whole lot of chaos taking place for which would be the perfect time for some, some uh, wonderful leader to, to step up, take control, comfort everybody, talk peace to everybody, and try to cheer everybody and pat people on the back. What better time? for somebody like Antichrist to step in and take his place because uh, the people that have rejected the real Jesus will accept a false one. That's what the Bible says. A lot of people are going to accept this Antichrist as the Messiah, the chosen Messiah that has come to bring peace to the world. And uh, a lot, a lot of those left behind will think that's who he is. They will choose this devil in flesh to be their Messiah. The book of Daniel and Revelation tell us that other political leaders will rise up with him, but that he will be so overwhelmingly wonderful that they're going to give their power to him. They're going to support him. They're going to they're just let him have it. He is going to become a one-world dictator who rules over a one-world government and a one-world religion. If you see any religious people stepping up crying, peace, peace, peace all the time, you better watch them because there's going to be a false prophet in cahoots with the man of sin, the Antichrist. Oh, there's a lot going to happen. But Christians aren't in the dark. Bible-believing, Bible-reading, Bible-studying Christians are not in the dark. And we have, we have no reason to fear except that we need to be telling those we love. We need to be telling our family. We need to be telling strangers. We need to be telling everybody about Jesus and that life, eternal life, and a wonderful, beautiful, eternal home is available to everyone. 
so let's see where am I so Daniel tells us about the one world government one world system the Antichrist Daniel tells us John in the book of Revelation tells us and all through the Bible we get glimpses of it we get glimpses of this man of sin <clears throat> Jesus let's see did I mean to say that in this excerpt so when Antichrist rules, it's going to be the final Gentile kingdom ruled by Satan on this earth before... <coughs> I think the devil's hindering me from getting this lesson out. Before Jesus comes to set up his kingdom. So um, in, in the Daniel studies that I have on YouTube, we studied... The image in uh, chapter two or four about that Nebuchadnezzar, <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar had the dream about, and Daniel interpreted the dream, and it was four worldwide kingdoms: <coughs> the kingdom that Jesus Christ rules and reigns over is going to be the last. We studied about the horns that Daniel and John both saw. They represent the nations of the world coming together to form this one world government of which we can already see being talked about. Globalism, globalism, that's what that's all about. We see it everywhere. And the one world government, one world religion, it's going to happen when all these powers come together and it will be formed. A one world confederation and the greatest of this will be replaced by one person the antichrist it will happen in the middle of the tribulation when he goes into the temple that he will allow to be rebuilt by the jewish people he will go into that temple satan at the middle of the three and a half years will fully indwell the antichrist <clears throat> And then literally all hell will break loose. And I tell a lot about this in those other studies that you can look up. Um, any, any under the prophecy playlist, the Israel playlist, and the Daniel playlist, any of those, you can find a lot more about this. Plus, there's a lot of good preachers and teachers on the Internet. Dr. David Jeremiah, his studies have been awesome. Uh, and he just keeps on and on. He knows, he knows like all Bible believers know, that our time is short. We don't have much time to keep telling people. So there's going to be no true peace on this earth until Jesus, the Prince of Peace, comes to rule this earth. Some religious people say that, oh yeah, there's going to be a great time of peace and then Jesus is going to come, but they got it backwards and they'll, they'll see that. When we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, what we're pay praying for is for Jesus to come because that's when the peace is going to come to Jerusalem. But remember, seven years earlier, we Christians are taken up to be with Him. Are you ready? Are you ready? It's so simple to be ready. Know that Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, came to earth he lived to show us how to live, and He died to show us how to die. He died on the cross to pay the debt for our sins. He was buried, He died, He was buried, but on the third day He arose again, having paid our sin debt. All we do in order to be saved, be assured of a home in heaven, is to receive Him into our heart as our Savior not into our stomach as the Eucharist, into our heart by faith as our Savior. I hope you will. I hope you'll believe. It, it's so easy. You don't even have to ask Him. The thief on the cross did not ask. Jesus saw the belief in His heart, and that very day He was saved. Oh, won't you believe? Won't you go to heaven? Won't you, won't you go to heaven and, and be assured um, that you're going to heaven? Lay down at night and not have to worry about it. It's not by baptism. It's not by church membership. It is not by doing good works. Jesus did it all 
of course, once we're saved, we're going to want to do good works because he who freely gave his life for us will want to freely give back something to him. Uh, other people might not see it in us, but oh, there's going to be times, there's going to be times Jesus sees our heart like no other can. He knows, he knows who's his and he knows who's not. So I, I just pray that today will be the day that that you accept him as your savior. God bless you. All right, how do I turn this thing off now? I cannot get y'all to go away. <laughs> I can't get me to go away. I'm trying to get me to go away, not y'all to go away. Ah, uh, all right. God bless you. This video is done.